The Amazon, a world of superlatives. The biggest river, the greatest rainforest, and the most exotic wildlife destination on the planet. It's estimated that half of the world's animal species live here. From the beautiful to the weird, the colorful to the cryptic, the iconic to the downright mysterious. So where do you start your quest for beasts? Let us be your guide as we navigate the Amazon and show you our 10 favorite wildlife greats. The Amazon, a river, a basin, and a rainforest. The river stretches over 6,000 kilometers from the Andes in Peru to the Atlantic Ocean. By volume, it's the biggest river in the world. The river runs through rainforest for almost half its length. Rainforest so vast, it could swallow the whole of Western Europe. This is the ultimate rainforest. And for many travelers, the ultimate wildlife destination. We asked Amazon experts which creatures to go and see. And this is their guide to the animal lovers most wanted. Be prepared for the spectacular and surprising as we take you on a journey to see the Amazon's wildlife greats. Heading the show is a gremlin with a whole lot of family appeal. Marmosets and their close cousins, the tamarins, have some of the most endearing faces in the forest. There are more than 20 different species with names to match. Spix's black mantle tamarin, the pied tamarin, the red-bellied mustache tamarin, the Midas tamarin, and the pygmy marmoset so tiny it fits in the palm of your hand. This is a family of golden white tassel deer marmosets and they live in groups of up to 15. Very unusually for primates, only the dominant female breeds. The rest of the family, even the males, help bring up the young. Hold up in a tree, the mother marmosets in labor. With his mate safe inside the nest, the dominant male checks for danger outside. There's trouble on the forest floor. It's a boa constrictor, and it can taste the scent of tiny primates. A call from the male causes the marmosets to scatter. But one of the family has not been fast enough. Fortunately, the mother marmoset is still safe inside the tree. She gives birth to twins, the most usual litter size. Acting as his partner's midwife, the male cuts the umbilical cord. When the group leave the nest, the female's got her hands full. But father gets back to his day job. He scent marks the branches to mark out their territory. The youngsters soon take an interest in food. If they're too young to catch it themselves, begging does the trick. When that stops working, stealing is another option. Eventually, they learn to forage for themselves. Fruits are the main part of the diet and are tackled by stripping the flesh and discarding the hard seeds inside.
Small animals like snakes are also on the menu. The head's bitten off very carefully. And the youngsters soon get to know there's meat on offer. It's not easy to tell the difference between marmosets and tamarins. But look at their mouths. Tamarins' jaws are more rounded, and their canines stick out. They're larger than marmosets and live in smaller families. Marmosets like to include tree gum in their diet, whereas tamarins tend to stick to fruit. Don't get marmosets and tamarins confused with these little guys, squirrel monkeys. They're small too, but they belong to another group of primates. We'll see them later in the show. Monkeys live in trees, don't they? Not always. Hiding under the surface is another monkey, the water monkey. Except this monkey is a fish. The arowana or water monkey is our next wildlife great because of a surprising talent. When floodwaters are high, it's tempted by insects and spiders. But it doesn't wait for them to fall in. Arowanas have been measured jumping three feet or a meter clear of the surface. Hinging open and shut in a split second, the arowana's jaws make a deadly trapdoor. But this Amazon predator isn't always such a mouthy brute. These little fish aren't its supper, they're its offspring. The gaping jaws become a safe haven. The signal to get on board is a subtle one. At the sight of danger like this giant piruruku, father wafts his barbels. As a further safety net in the big world, baby arowana carry a yolk sac. This keeps them nourished until they're ready to feed themselves. Little fish around here need all the protection they can get. You may recognize these tetra. That's because they're favorites in fish tanks all around the world. Pretty as they are, they make a great snack food. And these little fish are in big trouble. The leaf fish is a master of camouflage and subtle maneuvers. Tiny pectoral fins glided into position without blowing its cover, whilst the white furry lure at the end of its jaw catches the eye of potential prey. The tiny tetra are unaware of the danger until the leaf sucks them in. Tetra are also in danger from aerial predators. The green kingfisher picks a favorite perch to scan the surface. For a successful catch, it needs speed. It pins its wings back to accelerate and opens them as it reaches the water for stability and a quick exit. Fish only see the bird when it breaks the surface, so they have a split second to react. 
Tetra maximize the chance of escape by using pressure sensors that run down the length of their body. When the sensors are triggered, the Tetra is thrown sideways. Not very far, but it could be just enough. When the arowana leaps, it leaps alone. But the hatchet fish has company. These hatchets are on the run. The tacanary is hot on their heels and is about to make a deadly lunge. It seems there's no escape for the hatchets until they explode into the air. Their wing-like pectoral fins help them take off, and the axe-like keel on their body allows them to slice upwards through the water and cut back through without a belly flop. Leaping gives the hatchet fish the perfect get out. But the arowana is still our top flight Amazon fish. Graceful in the water and in the air, which is something you just can't say about the sloth. The sloth may hang like a moldy old carpet bag from a tree and share its name with a deadly sin, but that doesn't stop visitors to the Amazon loving this slow coach. That hasn't always been the case. One of the first Spanish explorers said he'd never seen an uglier or more useless animal. At least that stopped fur trappers turning it into coats like many of the other animals here. A sloth's coat is green because it's full of moss and algae. That doesn't seem to bother this moth. It makes its home here. Sloths are only found in the forests of Central and South America. There are three-toed sloths and two-toed sloths. But beware, these names are confusing. Don't look at the toes, look at the fingers. Every sloth has three digits on its back feet. But only the two-toed sloth has two digits, not three, on its front feet. They move three times slower than you'd walk. This apparent indolence is deceptive. In fact, they're very successful herbivores. If all the mammals in the Amazon were weighed together, two-thirds of that weight would be pure sloth. That's because sloths are incredibly common. But what is it about life in the slow lane that makes them so abundant? The answer's extreme specialization. Sloths are plant processing machines. Their stomachs are multi-chambered and full of leaf digesting bacteria. When stuffed full, the belly is more than a third of the total body weight. Meals stay in the stomach for up to a month before moving further down the gut. Slow processing goes with a slow metabolism and a low body temperature. Energy efficiency is the sloth's secret weapon. Toilet stops are once a week for the sloth. And tonight's the night for this one. It comes down from the tree for the occasion. It's also a night out for the resident moth. Sloth dung is where it lays its eggs and where its larvae will develop. Coming down from the tree obviously benefits the moth, but why does a sloth bother? Maybe the tree gets a concentrated shot of fertilizer, so the sloth will be rewarded with more leaves. Or perhaps it's just a gravity thing. 
If it stayed hanging upside down, things could get messy. The sloth also comes down to reach trees it can't get to by climbing. But it tries to avoid open ground. Those legs were meant for hanging, not walking. But when the Amazon's waters flood into the forest, the comical carpet bag suddenly becomes graceful. Not such a sloth, after all. What would you do if you got lost in the Amazon? Here are five top survival tips to help you out. Water. Drink more than you think you need. And remember, boil it first. Then use it as you please. When it's hot in the Amazon, it's really hot. Don't fight the heat. Take a siesta when and where you can. Food. You may have to change your taste to survive. We recommend lightly grilled tarantula. Mosquitoes. No mosquito net, no problem. A smoky fire will help you stay bite free. Rivers. All major settlements in the Amazon are built around the river. So follow a waterway downstream until you hit the main river and hopefully civilization. On your way, you may even come across the strangest dolphin on earth. Those lucky enough to get a glimpse of the Butu are transported into a world of myth and legend. Amazon folklore tells how these dolphins transform themselves into handsome young men who seduce unmarried girls. These beguiling beasts can also become alluring maidens who capture men's hearts and lead them away never to be seen again. Although sometimes called pink river dolphins, the Butu can also be white, gray, or pale blue. The color seems to depend on the clarity of the water. Muddy water tends to have pink dolphins, and clear water more gray. Compared with marine dolphins, the Butus look surreal. Their neck is extremely flexible, so they move their head in all directions. A real advantage in the underwater maze of the flooded forest. They have a large bulge on their head, the melon, for echolocation. They use it to produce clicks that radiate from the head and bounce off obstacles in the water and their food. Some experts believe the clicks stun the prey, making the catch more efficient. No wonder echolocation is crucial for these mammals. The Amazon is often murky with silt and plant tannins. Vision is of limited use, as the beady eyes of the Butu testify.
The Butu's got different fins, too. They lack the trademark dorsal fin of porpoising dolphins. Because they don't require such speed, that fin's limited to a humped ridge down their back. Their flippers are flat and triangular, so the Butu can glide close to the bottom of the river where food is abundant. It can also paddle these fins in opposite directions, using them like an oarsman turning a boat in a tight spot. At up to two and a half meters, or eight feet, this is a big dolphin to turn. Piranhas are a favorite food. We may fear them for their ferocious bite, but the Butus are so deft at catching them that they turn it into a game. Like other big-brained mammals, play seems important to Butus. They use games to pass skills onto their young. Their big brain also helps them find food in this complex, ever-changing river. Butus are not the only dolphins the locals see here. The Takushi lives where the river's deeper and looks much more like an ocean dolphin than the Butu. There's also a vegetarian in the river, the manatee. This is the Amazon's largest aquatic mammal. At nearly three meters or nine feet long, munching weeds all day requires little brain power. And this, along with a docile nature, makes it an easy target for a harpoon. Manatee meat is highly prized. Where humans fish, Butus are always in danger of getting caught in their nets. But fortunately, they aren't hunted for meat. They're considered too human-like. Eat one of these, and you might be eating a lost soul. The Amazon, a sea of green, and then a flash of color. Get ready to feast your eyes. The Amazon has the most colorful birds in the world. Even if you're not into birds, you can't fail to be into macaws. They're the most colorful air show on Earth. Macaws belong to the parrot family, and here the cast list is second to none. Sapphire rumped parrotlets, hyacinth macaws, red-bellied macaws, and maroon-tailed parakeets. Macaws, like all parrots, often mate for life. These scarlet macaws reinforce their bonds with daily bill touching and preening. Each partner is highly possessive of its mate. When these birds are kept as pets, this trait can cause problems. Parrots often won't tolerate an owner's spouse, and they can fly into a jealous rage or a sulk. After a lengthy courtship, the couple must find a place to raise their family. These blue and yellow macaws are making use of a broken palm tree. Raising chicks is a long-term project. The hatchlings stay with their parents for up to two years, and the pair won't raise any more chicks until they're gone. That's a lot of foraging trips for the grown-ups. Their beaks are hooked to tear into tough fruits and seeds that other animals can't tackle. Trees don't fruit all at once. Only two or three might be fruiting in a square mile. It's vital the macaws know where these are, and this may explain why these birds are so intelligent. They need to keep a mental map of where to find the next meal. 
In captivity, their intelligence can also cause problems. They get bored. If they don't have enough room to play, they'll tear their feathers out. For these blue and yellow macaw chicks, boredom won't be an issue. They have an endless rainforest to explore as they join the Amazon's other great parrots in flight. So far, we featured five wildlife greats. We've seen the twin fortunes of the marmosets, made a splash with the arowana, hung out with that delightful leaf-munching old carpet bag, the sloth, entered the mysterious world of the Butu dolphin, and been dazzled by macaws, the brightest sparks in the forest. And we've still got five more wildlife greats to go, including a giant. Any animal called giant is bound to intrigue, and the giant otter doesn't disappoint. Playful, charming, and inquisitive, up to eight feet or two and a half meters long, this is one of the Amazon's great characters. This otter has an extremely distinctive head, broad and robust, as it periscopes on top of a thick, muscly neck. Giant otters are sociable animals. They're usually seen in groups of up to nine. You can distinguish individuals by the white patterns on their throats. In a typical family, you'll find a breeding pair and their sub-adult and junior cubs. Sometimes these groups are joined by a wandering adult that's old enough to leave its own family. Enormous whiskers are standard issue. They help the otter navigate the cloudy waters when hunting for prey. When it dives, the otter closes up both ears and nostrils to stop water entering. Giant otters are also known as river wolves. One look at their teeth leaves you in no doubt this is an impressive predator. Piranhas don't look so scary when they're stuck in the jaws of this beast. If you happen to spot this otter on land, you'll see a cumbersome, heavy animal. The legs are too short for a graceful gait. This otter has taken aquatic adaption to the extreme. The webs of its feet stretch nearly the entire length of its toes, which are tipped by sharp claws to grasp a slippery catch. Although they cope well in cloudy water, clearer lake water obviously makes hunting less hit and miss. They seem to use the rivers to travel from one lake to the next. So although they are called river wolves, lake wolves might be more appropriate. Despite being so at home in the water, otters need resting up points to dry out and sleep. They keep the vegetation clear in these areas and regularly scent mark them. They also use dens to raise their cubs. If you want to see otters, dens are the best places to spot them. But they're also a dead giveaway to poachers. That's why this species is high on the endangered list. A female gives birth to two or three cubs that come out of the den after several weeks.
Cubs are naturally inquisitive, but they need to be careful. Den sites attract trouble. But if trouble's nearby, the cubs have a giant on their side. Next on Wildlife Greats, they're creepy, they're crawly, and they make a great snack for the biggest snout in the forest. Every forest trail, every branch, every leaf is a walkway for the Amazon's countless ants. So no wonder there are ant eaters here. This is the Tamandua, or collared anteater. Why the long face? Well, check out that tongue. At full reach, it can be nearly 16 inches or 40 centimeters long. This is a cousin of the better known giant anteater. Unlike the Tamandua, the giant anteater is a ground dweller and is too large to climb trees. Instead, it combs the grassland for carpenter ants. The tail is a massive brush that helps shade it while it sleeps. The tamandua's tail is even more useful. It acts as a stabilizer and anchors it when it climbs. Rotten trees are favorite hunting grounds where there are plenty of ants. The oversized claws help it break into nests and the pointed snout roots out the prey. The Tamandua's jaws are fused together and its mouth is no wider than a pencil. But that's easily big enough for ants, bees, and the occasional lick of honey. Baby tamanduas often start out a different color from the adults. Hitching a ride on their mother's back is the best place to learn the tricks of the trade. The mother sometimes parks them on a tree while she's busy. Once the baby finds its feet, it starts to follow its nose. Like the giant anteater, the Tamandua's eyes are small, suggesting poor eyesight. There's a third Amazon anteater whose eyes are bigger for its head because it comes out at night. The squirrel-sized silky anteater looks like a novelty teddy bear with synthetic fur. It too has oversized claws that make groundwalking difficult. This animal is clearly built for the trees. It shares a wraparound tail with a tamandua and has special back feet. A joint in the sole allows a claws to be folded back for extra grip. Claws are the tamandua's first line of defense. They rear up and slash their attacker. If that doesn't work, they'll try to crush their assailant with a powerful bear hug. They also have a skunk-like trick. This Amazon oddity produces a foul odor from its anal gland. No wonder it's sometimes called the stinker of the forest. But it's no stinker to us. Unusual, exotic, and mysterious, and let's face it, that ridiculously long tongue. It's definitely way up there in the hall of wildlife greats. Tempted to visit the Amazon? Here are five things you need to take. Waterproofs. They don't call it a rainforest for nothing. A nature guide for when you take an interest in nature, and nature takes an interest in you. Binoculars. Don't be left squinting. A pair of these are vital to get really close to wildlife. A hat, useful whatever the weather. And lastly, a hammock, so you can put your feet up. 
Hear them hooting, hear them howling, and watch them monkeying around. It's the Amazon's acrobats. Remember this little guy? He's the squirrel monkey. He's the size of a marmoset, but belongs to a family of much bigger primates. The capuchin-like monkeys. From cartoon-style primates that swing from their tails to extraordinary faces in the forest, monkeys are always near the top of the wildlife tourist's wish list. They're icons of the Amazon rainforest. Many of them with that classic New World monkey tail from which they dangle. The woolly monkey is one of the biggest in the Amazon and is a star in this group. Despite its size, it's extremely agile and the tail acts as a fifth limb. The tip is naked on the inside for a strong precision grip and the well-developed thumbs and toes help anchor it to the tree. This monkey doesn't like to swing but prefers to drop down vertically from branch to branch. When your mom's so mobile, you need to be an expert clinger on. Thick fur helps. There are always plenty of handholds. Take a woolly monkey, stretch it, and you get a spider monkey. It has the same naked tip to its tail, but the hands are more hook-shaped and the thumbs reduced to stumps. This animal is a swinger. Its shoulder joints are extremely flexible and its big toes grip thinner branches to help it move safely and with speed. Many of these capuchin-like monkeys are great gardeners without knowing it. When monkeys strip fruit from a tree, it looks like a scene of devastation below but many seeds pass through their bodies unharmed. While insects savor the monkey dung, the seeds get planted in their favorite compost. Of all the capuchin-like monkeys, it's the capuchins themselves that are thought to be the smartest. They're real opportunists and keen hunters. This kawadi smells danger. She must move her babies before the capuchins find her nest. She gets the first baby to the forest floor where it can find cover. But the marauders are canny. While she's away, they steal one of the pups left behind. She's been outwitted and outnumbered. Hiding in the shadows, at least one baby has managed to survive the ordeal and will soon be reunited with mom. There are 30 different species of capuchin-like monkeys in the Amazon. This is the most bizarre form, the wakari. Their bald foreheads and sunburned faces led the locals to call them English monkeys because of their similarity to the gin-swigging British. It's a striking, if strange, beast and one more reason to put monkeys on our most wanted list. Next, take a deep breath in for the mother of all constrictors, but make sure you can breathe out again.
Even if you don't have phobias, the name anaconda spells fear. But fear is often matched by fascination. That's why this awesome beast is our penultimate wildlife great. Only Asia's reticulated python grows longer than this monster, but there's no doubting which is bigger. Most wild snakes are skinny, but the anaconda doesn't need to be so lithe. Its weight is supported by the water, so it's as thick as a large thigh. On land, it has real trouble marching on its belly. It inches forward, mocked by the passing bird life. But as it slides into the water, its true colors are revealed. This is a graceful and awesome predator. Rats are small, but they're dispatched in the same way as larger prey. First the strike. Then the anaconda throws its coils around the rat's body, squeezing the air from its lungs. Snacks like these don't show the anaconda's full potential. It barely has to yawn to swallow a rat. A sharp-toothed caiman is a bigger deal. But they spend much of their day lazing in the water, making them sitting ducks for a stealthy attack. Now the anaconda has a firm grip. The caiman's teeth are useless. It slips down nicely. So what's the biggest thing this giant snake can swallow? Could it swallow a human? It all depends on shoulder size. If an anaconda can get its jaws past the shoulders, it's home and dry. This means that the biggest anaconda at 12 feet or four meters long could swallow a small adult. But researchers, even small ones, find they only attack if really harassed. Not that you'd want to test the theory. Where the biggest snake in the world is concerned, we suggest you keep a respectful distance. We're fast approaching our 10th and final animal, the cream of all the Amazon's wildlife greats. But before we reveal who steals the crown, let's recap on the nine animals we've seen so far. There are the feisty marmosets with full-on family appeal. The spider-snatching water launcher, the arowana. Hanging tight and doing swimmingly, the sloth. Amazon's bizarre river dolphin, the cheeky beaky, Butu. The perfect sight for sore eyes, magnificent macaws. Giant otters, you could easily lose your heart to these, but don't lose your head. The Tamandua and its ant-eating antics. Swinging for a living, Capuchin and Co, the Amazon's monkeys. And penultimate to our 10 stars, the anaconda. What Amazon animal could you possibly squeeze more excitement out of? Cream of the crop has to be the jaguar. No wonder this graceful beast name was taken for a sports car. Power, beauty, and strength are embodied in its graceful curves. It oozes big cat independent spirit and charismatic charm. It's the Amazon animal with the wow factor. But just like any number one celebrity, this jungle star comes with exclusivity. Only the very luckiest tourists get a glimpse, often 
at the water's edge. Unusually for a cat, the jaguar likes water. Fish and terrapins make an interesting catch. The jaguar has powerful jaw muscles and a larger head for its size than other big cats. One reason may be to break into the Amazon's tough-shelled animals. The jaguar sheds its tough image at mating time. They groom, lick and paw just like domestic cats. The timing of mating seems to be geared to the changing seasons. Pregnancy lasts three and a half months, so this female's young should be born in the rainy season, when there's more food for her to catch. Cubs start to emerge from the den at two weeks, and soon the hunting instinct kicks in. This cub is still too little to know what to do with a snake, but when he grows up, no other predator in the Amazon will match him for size. The jaguar may be the Amazon's only official big cat, but it's not the only feline in the forest. The ocelot looks like a miniature version, but is less robust with a more delicate head. The margay is smaller still. And like the ocelot, is an excellent climber and nighttime hunter. The jaguarundi is similar in size to the margay, but it's easy to identify. This is the only one of these cats without spots. And it would certainly turn tail if a jaguar came around the corner. Sometimes people confuse jaguars with leopards. So how do you tell the difference between the two big spotted cats? Look closely at the markings. The jaguar's rosettes have spots, the leopards don't. Myths and the jaguar seem to go hand in hand. The Maya and the Aztecs worship them as gods, and many Amazonians today see them as the spirits of the forest. The Matisse take this to the extreme. Every day they prepare their jaguar facial adornments and proudly display their cat-like tattoos. Like the jaguar, they stalk through the forest to hunt prey. Instead of claws, they use poison to attack. The name jaguar comes from a native Indian word, meaning the killer that takes its prey in a single bound. The Matisse hunter can be just as deadly. The jaguar. What other cat is the inspiration for a whole tribe of people? It's the Amazon's biggest cat and our biggest star in the biggest rainforest on Earth. It easily tops the bill, king of the Amazonian jungle. And what a jungle! The vibrant home to our wildlife greats, our favorites in a cast list so huge, there are many creatures yet to be revealed. With vast tracts of Amazonia still unexplored, who knows what you might discover when you visit. Get ready for India's wildlife greats. The beautiful, powerful, rare, and dangerous, packed into this country full of Eastern charm. From long-legged tree dwellers and calculating killers to creatures with godly status. Meet them in an array of spectacular landscapes. From everlasting grassy plains to dense jungle and the holy waters of the Ganges.
India is the jewel in Asia's crown, a country of incredible contrasts. Vibrant, majestic, and beautiful. Our experts have selected the 10 Indian animals tourists most want to see. Discover what makes these animals special and how they behave. Find out where to get up close and meet India's wildlife greats for yourself. First up is the sloth bear, the inspiration for the Jungle Book's Baloo. But this is no cartoon animal, it's one tough bear. It's out foraging in the toughest weather, a time when most bears would hibernate. A sloth bear may not look as threatening as a grizzly, but don't be fooled. Corner it and you're in real trouble. One of the best places to see them is in the forests of Palamau National Park in Bihar. Early explorers called them bear sloths because they thought they hung upside down in trees. When they realized they were wrong, they became sloth bears. If you want to see a wild one, be prepared to stay up late. They're most active in the evening. Sloth bears are smaller and shaggier than black or brown bears. They're also more hunched with squatter hind legs. They have a yellow or white chevron marking their chests, similar to the Asian black bear or moon bear. In fact, the moon bear gets its name from the crescent on its chest. Young sloth bears enjoy each other's company. They like to play fight. It's useful preparation for defending territory when they're older. Sloth bears climb with ease, but they prefer to knock honey and fruit to the ground where it's easier to pick up. There are many insects on the forest floor. Termites are a favorite food, but come packaged in hard earth mounds. So how does the sloth bear reach them? Step one. Sniff out the mound with your long nose. Step two, rip into it with your long curved claws. Step three, stick your snout in, keep the nostrils shut, and blow. Sloth bears, like their termites, dust free. Step four, suck them up through the gap in your front teeth. Peeling back your lips helps the termites flood in. Our next wildlife great chooses far bigger prey than ants. Think of leopards and you think of Africa. But India has leopards, too. Almost 10,000 of them. These loners are so adaptable, if you look hard, you'll find them just about anywhere. From thick forests to open country, and even large cities like Mumbai.
Gir National Park in Gujarat is a good place to spot them. Leopards keep their dens well hidden. Two to three cubs is the usual litter size and they're born blind and helpless. The female moves dens regularly during the first few weeks to keep them safe from snakes and other big cats. The cubs don't venture out until they're six weeks old when they follow their mother on short trips. At four months, they'll join her on hunting trips to learn the tricks of the trade. Agile to perfection, the leopard's an adept climber. In the heat of the day, it likes to rest a long way from intruders where it can't be disturbed. The topmost branch of a tall tree is ideal. Lurking in the dry grasslands below is a much larger predator, a relic from an ancient population. Not many people know there are lions here. This is India's rarest cat. Asiatic lions came from Africa to the Indian subcontinent 100,000 years ago. They once spread over the whole of northern and central India. The only place you'll find them now is in Gir National Park. Cattle also share the park. Local farmers must be vigilant because the lions are hungry cattle killers. This leopard, however, has other prey on her mind. An adult chital deer weighs as much as a man and makes a hefty meal. She bides her time. The deer can easily spot her in open ground. They'll have a head start in any attack. She needs to get close without being seen. The leopard stalks her prey until she's right up close and takes it by surprise. Of all the big cats, the leopard is the most powerful pound for pound. This kill will last her for nearly a week. A leopard is difficult to spot on safari, but it's hard to miss the animal coming up next. In India, all animals are sacred and one of the most unlikely creatures has a temple to itself. In Deshnuk in western Rajasthan is the temple of Hindu deity Karni Mata, home to thousands of black rats. The ornate building dates from the early 20th century. The entrance is lavishly decorated with sculpted marble paneling. Here people flock to pay their respects to the rats living among the statues and shrines. To believers, these are no ordinary rats. They're the embodiment of the souls of the children of Karni Mata. Karni Mata was a 15th century mystic and an incarnation of Durga, the divine mother goddess. The story goes that Karnimata tried to restore a dead child back to life. 
but was blocked by Yama, the god of death. From then on, Karni Mata ensured that when any of her people died, they would temporarily inhabit the body of a rat. That's why these rodents are so revered. They embody the spirits of children who may be reborn in the next life as sadhus or holy men. Special holes around the courtyard allow the rats private passage throughout the temple. The rats make their nests in the temple walls. Females mate at three months old and produce six litters a year. Just 10% survive, keeping the numbers in check. Only the fittest make it to adulthood. The rats have their every need catered for. They have a luxury place to live and are fed milk, grain, and bread by visitors. Holy men come every day to share their meals with the rodents. They may not be your ideal dinner date, but it is considered a blessing to eat food drenched with rat saliva. These black rats live in harmony with their human devotees. Surprisingly, few of the worshippers get sick after lunch at the temple. The swarming rodents may not appear divine to some of us, but to many, this is a very holy place, where it's a privilege to get married surrounded by hundreds of uninvited guests. Rats are not the only animals considered holy in India. Here are our five favorite animal deities. Nandi, the white bull, represents strength and virility. He escorts Shiva, the destroyer and regenerator of the universe. Garuda is the god of the birds, with the body of a man and the head and wings of an eagle. He carries Vishnu, the preserver of the universe. Hanuman is revered for his intelligence. He is a monkey with a sorcerer's powers. Sheshnag is the serpent god of a thousand heads. Vishnu sleeps on a bed of his coils. Finally, there's Ganesh, the much-loved god with the head of an elephant and the body of a man. He is brave, loyal, strong and gentle, and forgets nothing. Moving from the godly to the regal, meet the antelope of the kings, once a favorite of the Maharajas. Black bucks lead a heated territorial life on India's grassy plains. The largest herd is 2,000 strong. You'll find them in Velavador National Park in the western state of Gujarat. Come here in February and you're in for a fantastic display. This is when males compete for land to lure the does in heat. Meet the king of the antelopes, a dominant buck. He's an old-fashioned monarch whose aim in life is to guard his territory and maintain a harem. 
He marks the center of his kingdom with a dung pile and scent marks the boundaries with a musky secretion from the glands below his eyes. Everybody wants to expand their empire. It's a battle for real estate. Territories are packed together and are little bigger than a basketball court. Each male's itching to get a slice of his neighbor's land, including this subordinate male, who's out to challenge the dominant buck. Buck's horns are their best weapon. They develop the spiral shape at age two. A clash risks serious injury. Finally, our dominant male holds his own and chases the challenger off. His success has not gone unnoticed. As evening approaches, the black buck are joined by harriers. They dance together in the fading light. Our defeated challenger is badly hurt and barely has the energy to move. That's bad news when Indian jackals are on the prowl. Day breaks and the subordinate males not made it through the night. This is a good season for jackals to gorge themselves and harriers get to pick at the scraps. Triumphant, our dominant male sits pretty in his territory. If a doe is to reach him, she must first fend off lesser suitors on the way. She leaps into the air at the height of a grown man. An impressive dung pile is as attractive to her as the sweetest aftershave. Our buck is heavily in demand. Now the doe's here, she makes the buck work for his date and he struts an alluring dance. Success, and the king and his mate are together at last. From regal heights to the watery underworld, up next are two giants whose ancestors walked with dinosaurs. Meet two of the world's largest crocodiles, the mugger and the narrow-nosed gharial. The menacing mugger is a titan amongst freshwater crocs at over 16 feet or five meters long. Gharials are bigger still at up to 23 feet or seven meters. The sun rises over the Ganges. Hindus believe these holy waters cleanse their souls. Bathers have no idea India's largest freshwater crocodile lurks below. Gharials have been accused of stealing bodies from funeral pyres on the riverbanks, but they don't attack people. They are shy fish eaters. They spend most of their time underwater, revealing only their telltale nostrils and eyes. The Gharials' narrow snout is designed to slice through the water. 
the jaw is lined with up to 110 razor-sharp interlocking teeth. Once it sees a fish, the gharial lifts its head out of the water to reposition the prey for swallowing. Like other crocodiles, it must eat above the surface to avoid swallowing too much water, or it will drown. It's easy to tell males and females apart. Mature males have a bulbous lump on the tip of their nose called a gara or bowl in Hindi. This may seem ugly to us, but to a female, the bigger the bump, the more attractive the croc. The gara also acts as a bubble blowing device, all important for attracting females during courtship. Madras Crocodile Park is the best place to catch gharials. It's also a great location to see some truly ruthless killer crocs, the muggers. These serious looking reptiles won't steal your purse. The name mugger comes from a Hindi word meaning mysterious sea creature. Unlike gharials, they will attack humans, but that doesn't mean other predators leave them alone. When this mother croc goes out to hunt, she leaves her nest open to another reptile. Fresh crocodile eggs are a real favorite for a monitor lizard. A monitor's unusual in risking such a heist. Crocodiles don't negotiate when it comes to defending a nest. They'll snap at anything that comes too close. They make a meal out of at least one human a year. So don't mistake the smiling mugger for a harmless gharial. Know your crocs before you step in the water. Let's recap on our first five Indian wildlife greats. First, we met the bungling sloth bear who just loves eating termites. Then the elusive leopard, happy in town or country. Next were the black rats at home in their five-star temple. King of his own territory was the black buck. And we've just seen India's colossal crocs, the gharials and the muggers. Our next wildlife great is a very unlikely unicorn, one of India's most endangered mammals. This animal would put a knight in shining armor to shame. The Asian one-horned rhinoceros is only found in the Indian subcontinent. The best place to see them is Kaziranga National Park in Assam. Here they share the bathing pools and grassland with elephants, hog deer, and the world's largest herd of wild Asian buffalo. Mina birds use rhinos as feeding platforms, picking ticks and other parasites off their backs. They follow the rhinos as they graze, snacking on insects stirred up in the grass. Male rhinoceros unicornis weigh in at well over the weight of an average family car. So how do you tell this rhino from its cousins? Look at the horn. The Indian rhino, like the Javan rhino, only has one horn. The African black and white rhinos and Sumatran rhino all have two horns. The mouth tells you what the rhino eats. The Indian and Javan rhino have pointed mouths and overhanging top lips. They can tackle many different plants. The African white rhino has a square lip designed just for grass. 
The Indian rhino skin is unique. It's armor plated. The shields are formed by heavy folds of skin at the shoulder and hindquarters, making it look prehistoric. Rhino horn is still sought after in Asia as an aphrodisiac and cure-all. Made of densely matted hair and as long as a carving knife, it's quite a weapon. Baby rhinos are born without horns. This three-day-old calf weighs as much as an adult woman. But seen next to his mother, he still has a lot of growing to do. At 18 months, he stops suckling and moves on to eating grass and leaves. At three, he feels more secure and finds a friend to play with. For a male rhino, defending a territory is a smelly business. Boundaries are sprayed with urine and dung is built into enormous piles. The dung heap is a warning signal to rivals, but a magnet for insects. Butterflies drink up the minerals and birds follow them in. A rhino's nose is sensitive, but his eyesight is lousy he couldn't see across a street. He may think he's alone in his territory, but he could be sharing it with several subordinate males. These trespassers are pushing their luck. If they get too near, the dominant male can become dangerously aggressive. This one's lucky. An angry rhino can kill if provoked. And don't think you're safe in a vehicle. Get too close or surprise one, and that horn can pierce metal. At least two people a year die from rhino attack. Tick-pecking minas are often found atop a rhino, but here are five other Indian birds to look out for. The Pied Kingfisher stands out from the crowd. It's the largest bird capable of true hovering flight. Spotted Owlets, one of the cutest birds around. They come out after dark to feed on insects and rodents. Alice's fish eagle is a raptor to be reckoned with. Fish, birds, and reptiles are all within its grasp. Elegant saurus cranes mate for life. Their bond is so strong, they're an Indian symbol of fidelity. Lastly, the peacock, known as the bird with a hundred eyes, the wheel-like tail represents the cosmic cycle and the all-seeing sun. Peacocks have great flair, but coming up next are the animals that are top of the tree when it comes to character. We've chosen two monkeys for our Indian wildlife greats, the mischievous macaques and the long-legged langurs. You can catch them monkeying around in Manus National Park in Assam. Welcome to the world of rhesus macaques, where life is full of fun.
Macaques are social animals. They gather at the river's edge to lick salts from the stones on the shoreline. But when it comes to meal times, the macaques move up to the trees. One of their favorite foods is the flower of the leafless flame of the forest. They peel back the petals and eat only the sweet stamen inside. Some of the stamens are stored in special cheek pouches so they can save them for later. Rose-ringed parakeets join in the feast by licking the nectar. And Chital deer vacuum up any fallen petals. There are more agile acrobats in the branches than the macaques. The Hanuman Langers. Langers have much longer limbs than macaques. Langer means long tail in Hindi, and it's easy to see why. Their tails act as a stabilizer, helping them balance as they leap from tree to tree. Hanuman langurs share the forest of eastern India with a more primitive relative, the slow loris. The loris gets its name from a Dutch word for clown. Usually nocturnal, it picks its way along branches looking for insects to eat. It has nails on all but its second fingers, which end in a claw, a useful grooming tool. Hanuman langurs come down from the trees to drink, pick up fallen fruit, or replenish body salts by licking earth. They won't stay long, though, if our next animal's lurking in the leaves. Like it or not, the fascination provoked by this hunter makes it a true wildlife great. Cobras are both feared and revered throughout India. Snakes matter here. The country's full of them, 238 species in all. Cobras are the most poisonous. There's the spectacled cobra, the monocled cobra, and the king cobra. Our first slippery serpent is the spectacled cobra, the most celebrated of all snakes in India. It's also one of the most deadly. On the 5th of July, in the tiny village of Bhattashirala in Maharashtra, the villagers celebrate the Festival of Snakes. Cobras are taken to the temple in a grand procession and charmed outside. Cobras are the snakes most commonly used by snake charmers. It's not the sound of the flute that lures the deadly serpent out of its basket, Snakes are deaf. They haven't any ears or even eardrums. The cobra senses vibrations through its skin, muscle, and bones. These vibrations are transmitted to its inner ear. The music is too high pitched for the cobra to pick up. It sees the movement of the flute as a threat and writhes up to defend itself. Cobras spread their hoods when they're aggravated. The spectacled cobra flares its hood wider than any other. On the back, it has classic cobra markings. Two rings mimicking a pair of eyes, fooling predators into thinking it's facing them, so they daren't attack it from behind. Cobras don't always have striking markings. Sometimes they're pure white, like this albino. Cobras are respected so much in India that few people will kill one, preferring to release captured snakes back into the wild. 
The spectacled cobra has a much shinier sister with only one circle on the back of her hood. This is the monocled cobra, revered in both Hindu and Buddhist mythology. Buddha was protected from a storm by the cobra spreading its hood above his head. In thanks, Buddha touched the snake and his blessing remained as the mark on its hood. These snakes are not to be trifled with. Each year, thousands of people die in India from cobra bites. However, there is a cure which helps fight the poison. Cobras are milked for their venom, and from this, antivenom is made. In fact, cobra poison has many hidden properties and is even being studied as a potential cure for cancer. Meet India's serpent royalty, the King Cobra. Come across one of these in the forest and you've reason to be scared. Stretching further than a New York taxi, this is the longest venomous snake in the world. These tiny King Cobra babies push their way out of their eggs with their heads. Juveniles are black with yellow stripes, which fade as they get older. This one's only as long as a ruler and may look harmless, but its bite is just as venomous as an adult's. You may think you look tasty, but a King Cobra has only one thing on his lunch menu, and that's other snakes. He hunts out his prey using his forked tongue to taste their scent in the air. Having spotted his prey, the King Cobra strikes fast, aiming for the head. Hunting is a risky business. His venom is lethal, but so is his praise. The Cobra sinks in his long fangs, releasing a teaspoon of poison each time, enough to kill 20 men. Within seconds, the victim is paralyzed. Slowly, the cobra swallows down the meal into his long stomach. There's such a huge variety of snakes in India, it's no wonder they play such a big role in Indian folklore. Deadly Indian cobras are difficult to spot, but you won't miss our next animal about town. In India, elephants are something special. They were first domesticated at least 3,000 years ago. A highly intelligent animal, the elephant is respected and worshipped throughout the country participating in many Hindu festivals. The Mahouts who train the elephants stay with them for life, building an extremely strong bond. Elephants are still used today for logging and to transport goods and people. So how do you tell an Indian elephant from its African brothers? The elephant is the largest mammal in India. It weighs in at five and a half tons, and a fully grown bull elephant can be up to 11 feet or three meters tall. African elephants, however, are 40% bigger and 30% taller. The most well-known difference between these two giants is the size of their ears. Our Indian elephants are smaller. An elephant's trunk is its best known trademark. It's made up of 40,000 different muscles and not one bone. The Indian elephant has only one finger-like projection at the tip of its trunk, rather than two. However, our Indian elephant is much better at using its trunk than the African ones. Its trunk muscles are better coordinated. Elephants walk on tiptoe. Only the very end of their toe bones touch the ground. Their heel bones rest on a fatty cushion to help spread the weight. 
A good place to see a herd of wild elephants is the lakes of Periyar National Park in Kerala. Keeping cool is a major occupation. Fanning the ears is instinctive. Babies can do this from birth. That's more than can be said for the trunk. This little calf doesn't seem to have got the hang of using his best asset. An Indian elephant's pregnancy lasts 22 months. A newborn calf is twice as tall as a human baby, but 38 times its weight. Babies suckle with their mouth, not their trunk, and take 10 years to wean. Young calves have a careful eye kept on them by their mothers and other females in the herd. Elephants communicate mainly by touch and making deep grumbling sounds that are amplified inside their trunks. They can hear far deeper sounds than we can detect. They communicate across long distances and talk to each other by infrasonic calls, which can travel through the ground and be heard six miles or 10 kilometers away. But when it comes to affairs of the heart, communication breaks down. Bull elephants can get aggressive when they're after females. In spite of their occasionally feisty nature, elephants make for a great vantage point on which to discover India. Let's recap on the nine Indian wildlife greats we've seen so far. Heading the show was the scruffy old sloth bear. Next, we spotted the leopard in the forests of gear. In Rajasthan, we saw black rats living in the lap of luxury. In Gujarat, we met black buck, antelope of the kings. Next were the gharials and muggers, goliaths among crocodiles. Then, the giant unicorn, the one-horned rhinoceros. High up in the Indian jungle were the macaques and langurs. The deadly dancing cobra has taken our bronze medal. And our penultimate Indian wildlife great is the elephant. Elephants are the only animals that our number one would think twice about attacking. This makes them the ideal perch on which to view India's most famous big cat. Our ultimate wildlife great is the jewel in India's crown, the Bengal tiger. A symbol of India's wilderness, a hundred years ago, there were 40,000. Today, only 3,000 remain. Bandavgarh Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh is a superb place to see them. Tiger cubs may be born helpless and blind, but these are India's ultimate jungle predators in the making. Let's discover what these cubs will need to become perfectly designed killers. The famous orange and black stripes break up their outline so they melt into the background. It's a perfect coat for a future assassin. The eyesight develops to become piercingly accurate so they can spot the slightest movement in the undergrowth and zero in on their prey. Tigers are silent stalkers. Huge paws and careful balance will help the cubs edge their way quietly through the undergrowth. 
they will develop huge muscles in their limbs. These will give them the power to sprint over short distances. In the future, the razor sharp claws will help the cubs latch onto prey and bring it down. The cubs canines, now barely visible, will grow to be nearly 10 times the length of ours. White spots will be used to show aggression. When a tiger turns them forward, it means business. As adults, they will hunt alone like their mother. She must kill at least every three days to keep her family from going hungry. To a tiger, these langers are fair game, especially on the ground. Alarm calls are used to alert the troop. The tiger's too quick for a juvenile. Her canines kill instantly. This is a mere snack for the tiger family. The mother will have to kill again soon. With the cutest cubs, the most fashionable coat in the jungle, teeth like daggers, and the art of killing perfected. The Bengal tiger is the pride of India. It deserves prime place amongst our 10 Indian wildlife greats. This is just a glimpse of the best of the wildlife that thrives in India's spectacular landscapes. Look out for these key animals and who knows what other Eastern treasures you might find in this sacred and colorful country. There are many wildlife spectacles in the world, but not all creatures are this abundant. Spot a rare animal and you see something really special. But how do you track down the world's most charismatic and endangered beasts? We'll show you where to go, what to look for, and what else you'll meet on the way. There are many endangered species in the world, but it's the rare iconic species that capture the imagination. Animals that live in some of the most beautiful wilderness on Earth. We've chosen 10 of these animals based on exclusivity and sheer wildlife spectacle. Be prepared for the jaw-dropping, the breathtaking, and the awesome, as we show you where to find the rarest of the wildlife greats. First stop, Monterey, California. Monterey is situated on the coast of Northern California. Its rich temperate waters support a fascinating array of marine life that's easily accessible to the wildlife tourist.
you're guaranteed to see seals and sea lions who may be as curious about you as you are about them. Gray whales are also occasional visitors. But when it comes to rare animals, it's an otter that steals the show. And they don't come much cuter than this. This is the sea otter. By the early 1900s, they had nearly been hunted to extinction. But fortunately, a small colony in Alaska survived and slowly spread down the coast. These otters in Monterey are their descendants. Their incredibly dense fur keeps them warm. There are up to a million hairs per square inch. That's four times as many as on a whole human head. The otter fluffs up its fur to trap air next to its skin for insulation. They can dive to over 300 feet, nearly 100 meters, and stay under for five minutes, giving them plenty of time to forage. Sea otters like to eat sea urchins, crabs, and abalone shellfish. This diet comes with tough packaging, but it's no problem for these otters. They use rocks to smash food out of hiding places. The rocks are often carried to the surface to use as a hammer or an anvil. This is one of the very few animals, apart from humans, that uses tools. Sea otters are devoted mothers. They groom and suckle their pups while afloat. When the female dives, the pup gets left on the surface, held up by the air trapped in its fluffy coat. Baby otters must learn how to find and tackle their prey, but accidents with gill nets and oil spills have left many pups orphaned. Pups don't survive long without their mother, but fortunately, help is at hand. Monterey Bay Aquarium has rescued many sea otters. The divers become foster mothers and take the pups on foraging trips to show them the many ways to find food. If the pups are good learners, there's a strong chance they can be successfully released into the wild. If you visit Monterey, you might spot one of these grown-up orphans, perhaps teaching its own youngster how to find a meal. It's thought that there are now more than 2,000 sea otters off the Californian shore. But there's no room for complacency. A population this small is still in danger. Spot one now, and you have a rare privilege indeed. From California, we head west and down under. Could the rare creatures here be bouncing into obscurity? The kangaroo is a symbol of Australia. They're doing well, but many of Australia's marsupials are in trouble. These pouched mammals evolved separately from the rest of the world, making them vulnerable to invaders. Cats, dogs, rats, and farming have taken their toll. Some of these endangered creatures now only survive on islands off the mainland or in remote areas hardly touched by humans. Here's our guide to some of Australia's endangered oddities. 
The first sailors thought these animals were overgrown rats. But this isn't a rodent's walk. It's the unmistakable hop of a kangaroo. And this is the quokka. On the mainland, they're extinct, but they still breed freely on Rottenest Island. The endearing-looking numbat has hung on to its mainland habitat, but barely. It clings to a small patch of eucalypt forest in the southwest. Unusually for a marsupial, these creatures don't have pouches, which is why they carry their babies around on their backs. On Bernier Island, you'll find the only member of the kangaroo family that burrows the burrowing betong, also known as the rat kangaroo. They became extinct on the mainland in the 1960s. The culprits probably introduced foxes and cats. Bilbies were once widespread across Australia, but now they are restricted to the dry, infertile scrubland in the northwest, where there are few foxes. See it from a distance and it looks like a rabbit. But get closer and the nose shows this is a very different animal. You wouldn't expect to find a kangaroo in a tree, but in Northwest Australia, you're in for a surprise. Tree kangaroos have longer forelimbs than their terrestrial cousins. They're designed for grabbing branches. Its hind legs are built for walking, not hopping, and its feet have special non-slip soles. It's not just gentle leaf-eating marsupials that have become rare in Australia. The voracious Tasmanian devil was wiped out on the mainland and now is only found on the island it gets its name from. It's thought the devils were driven out by dingoes, brought from Asia by immigrating Aboriginal people more than 5,000 years ago. In a twist of fate, the dingoes themselves are now in danger. Interbreeding with domestic dogs means there are very few purebreds left. The best place to see them is on Fraser Island, off the East Coast. But if you don't have time for a round Australia tour, why not visit one of the many conservation centers whose breeding projects have helped save Australia's unusual mammals from the jaws of extinction. Up next, step onto the island of Komodo and tell your friends you've seen a real life dragon. The Komodo Dragon. It's a giant with an exclusive address. This dinosaur lookalike is only found in Indonesia on a narrow band of islands east of Bali. And it's on Komodo Island itself that they're easiest to spot. Getting to Komodo isn't easy you have to island hop and then take a six-hour boat ride. But it's worth it as soon as you see the imposing volcanic mass rising from the sea. In geological time, Komodo Island is not that old, only 50 million years. But its prehistoric-looking lizards make you think you're in the age of the dinosaurs. As soon as you set foot on shore, keep your wits about you. These lizards can be twice as big as a man and have a horrific bite. The locals have become used to their presence, but they never lose their respect for them. That saliva contains a cocktail of deadly bacteria that can make you so ill you may never recover. That's why the deer and pigs that come to drink at Komodo's watering holes have to be so careful. Don't trust a dragon even when it looks relaxed. If it's warm from the heat of the day, it can quickly launch an attack. 
The slightest nip from these terrible jaws could cause death from infection in two days. The dragons can also kill outright. A 220 pound or 100 kilo male can run as fast as a human sprinter. Komodos don't distinguish between humans and other prey. Anything they encounter on the island is fair game, even their own young. They spend the first two years of their life hiding in trees, where it's safe from the cannibals below. Adult dragons are too big to climb. Komodo's coast is rich in vegetation, so it's a popular place for wildlife. The dragons are regular visitors here, terrorizing the colorful crabs and aptly named mudskippers. As well as eating live prey, the lizards are happy to scavenge. Local fishermen oblige by providing scraps from the daily catch. Most visitors to Komodo come just to see the giant lizard, but don't forget there's wildlife offshore too. These protected waters have great potential for diving and snorkeling. But make sure you don't bump into a dragon, unless you want to become endangered too. The Komodo dragon has deadly jaws. Here are five other unusual creatures with a nasty bite. The octopus uses a tough beak to tear into prey. Some species also deliver a lethal dose of poison. The slow loris harvests poison from a gland in its arm. Mixed with saliva, it makes for a toxic bite. A giant centipede. This one's from Arizona. A bite from its jaw will make you extremely sick. The Gila monster is one of only two venomous lizards in the world. It clamps onto flesh and uses its hollow teeth to chew in nerve toxin. The venom of the daddy longlegs is rumored to be more toxic than any other spider. Fortunately, its jaws are too weak to penetrate human skin. The theory remains untested. Next, we head to a true African oasis. But is it sanctuary enough for Africa's rarest dog? The Akavango, the jewel of the Kalahari. It's a river that never makes it to the sea, but instead creates a vast wildlife oasis in the north of Botswana. It's home to Africa's most endangered predator, the wild dog. This pack hunter used to roam much of Africa, but now there are fewer than 5,000 left. The Akavango is one of its last remaining strongholds. They share this watery world with all the African favorites. Much of the land here is swamp, so it's unsuitable for farming. The animals here live in relative peace. This reserve is also a birder's paradise. A wild dog pack size can be more than 25 animals. They're incredibly social and love to paw and lick each other to maintain contact. Get close to a wild dog and there's a strong musky odor. This smell may be another way in which the group keep track of each other.
wild dogs have had it hard. Each pack needs up to 1,200 square miles or 3,000 square kilometers of territory to hunt. Many territories have been carved up by roads and farms, and the dogs have been infected with rabies and canine distemper. A pack of wild dogs hunting is an awesome sight. They'll chase their prey for over a mile until they wear it down. Pack members take turns to head the assault. Wild dogs have a reputation as vicious killers, which is why they were shot indiscriminately. See a pack socialize, and it's a different story. The family is headed by a dominant pair, and everyone helps to raise the pups. That's perhaps why there can be up to 21 in a single litter. This gives hope for the wild dog's recovery. If they can be given enough land and be kept free from disease, they may just bounce back. If you visit the Akavango, you'll help keep this luscious landscape reserved for the animals, including this rarest of all the hunters. Next, we visit Darwin's Living Laboratory, some of the most famous islands on Earth. The Galapagos Islands are a dream destination for the discerning wildlife tourist, and a must when it comes to endangered wildlife greats. This is Charles Darwin's most famous study site, the place where his theory of evolution got its wings. It's home to some incredibly rare species, such as giant tortoises, marine iguanas, the Galapagos sea lion, and the only penguin to live on the equator. The Galapagos Islands belong to Ecuador. They're an hour and a half flight out into the Pacific from the capital, Quito. If you land on the island of Santa Cruz, you're just a short step from the Charles Darwin Research Station, where they breed the rare giant tortoises. The reason these little giants are kept in pens is because it's a tough world out there. For centuries, sailors collected the tortoises for food and left behind rats, cats, and dogs that eat both babies and eggs. When Darwin arrived here, there were 15 different kinds of tortoise, each on their own island. But now, there are only 11. Soon, there may be only 10. Lonesome George from the island of Pinta is the last of his kind. It's ironic that the creature that gave Galapagos its name is under such threat. Galapago is a Spanish word for saddle, the distinctive shape of this tortoise's shell. Venture to other islands and you'll find such delights as blue-footed boobies, lava lizards, land iguanas, waved albatross, and cormorants that have lost the power of flight. The marine wildlife here is equally fascinating. The Galapagos penguin is an oddity. No other penguin is found at the equator. It survives here because although the land is hot, the sea is chilled by currents from the south. They share the water with playful sea lions that delight the snorkeler with their antics, and even surf the waves.
the Galapagos is home to the world's only marine iguana. This unique lizard uses its horny mouth to graze on algae below the waterline. It gets rid of salt by blowing it out of its nose. At breeding time, male iguanas must secure a patch of dry land near a nesting site. Head bobbing is used to warn off competitors. If the warning doesn't work, a tussle breaks out. One of the most striking things about the Galapagos animals is that they're incredibly tame. You may find yourself face to face with some of the rarest creatures on Earth, but don't stray off path. Visits to the island are strictly regulated. If you stick to the rules, you will help keep these fabulous islands one of the top places to see rare animals for years to come. So far in Wildlife Greats, we've featured five places to see rare animals. Our choices are based on a combined wow factor for both destination and wildlife. Let's recap what we've seen so far. First up was Monterey, California, where two and a half thousand sea otters rule the waves. Australia, with its classic landscapes, featured second. Look beyond the familiar, and the rare marsupials are bound to intrigue. Then we met dragons, 3,000 of them on the remote island of Komodo. Next, we took a trip to the Akavango, where African hunting dogs run wild. And we've just seen Darwin's Galapagos Islands. They're packed with rare animals, but none so lonesome as George. Next, we head to the world's fourth largest island, where rare ghosts dance in the forest. As the mist rises over Madagascar, haunting calls resonate across the valleys. The calls belong to an ancient group of primates, the lemurs. The name lemur comes from a Latin word meaning ghost. There are more than 20 different species, and they range from the tiny mouse lemurs and dwarf lemurs to the larger indri. Perhaps the strangest of all the lemurs is the nocturnal eye eye. It uses its spindly middle finger to probe for grubs. The best known of the lemurs is the ringtail. Once they've warmed up in the morning sun, they really come to life. Scent is a big deal if you're a ringtail. They rub odor onto their tails and waft them in the air to communicate their status. Lemurs were once found all over Africa, but today they only live on Madagascar. On mainland Africa, they were outcompeted by the monkeys, but here it's a different primate that's pushing them out. Madagascar used to be covered in trees. Now only 10% of the forest remains. Ringtails are social animals and head out to forage in groups. Sometimes a less familiar lemur crosses their path. This is Varro Shifaka. Sideways leaping is its trademark. Perhaps the reason for this distinctive mode of travel is Madagascar's top predator. There are no big cats here, so this oddity takes their place. It's a fossa. It has the nose of a dog, the teeth of a leopard, 
and the whiskers of a mongoose. And a giant mongoose is just what it is. Leaping may be the best way to escape it. Trees may guarantee safety from some predators, but not this one. The shifaka must leap to somewhere the fossa can't follow. The trees of the spiny forest have formidable thorns. The shifaka navigates them with pinpoint accuracy. The fossa is some acrobat, but its paws just aren't nimble enough for the thorns. Beyond the spiny forest, there's an even more alien landscape. These razor-sharp limestone cliffs are found in Ankarana, in the north of the island. It's clearly a hostile environment, but the versatile lemurs manage to live here. This is the crowned lemur, one of the rarest lemurs of all. Somehow, it manages to leap about on the knife-edge rock. It's safe here because this is one place humans can't farm. As the world of these ancient primates collides with the demands of the new, the pressure's on to find a compromise between farming and conservation. So catch these ghosts while you can by visiting Madagascar's national parks. Your custom will help save these forest haunts just for lemurs. Next, find out the best place to get up close to this rare cousin of ours and see how he's doing in the wild. Borneo is home to that most charismatic of great apes, the orangutan. Study orangs for any length of time, and you're no doubt this is a highly intelligent animal. Look at an orangutan, and you could be looking at yourself. They have a whole range of behaviors that are incredibly human. They're good problem solvers. This one is making a hat. It seems they hate the rain just as much as we do. When they can't reach the tree they want, they get inventive, using branches as pendulums or springboards. Sadly, this cousin of ours is highly endangered. Poaching, forest fires, and logging have destroyed much of its range. The good news is, these orangutans have been given a home. They're orphans at the Sepilok Forest Rehabilitation Center. Sepilok is in Sabah, the Malaysian part of Borneo. And the rehab center welcomes visitors. The aim of the center is eventually to get the orphans back into the wild. Every day, they're taken into the forest to get accustomed to the ways of the jungle. These are good opportunities to practice techniques and strengthen muscles. Orangs are well-equipped climbers. Their toes are opposable, like our thumbs so dangling upside down is no problem. Even a tiny baby can put our acrobatic skills to shame. Sometimes it takes a while to build up confidence. 
But every ape is treated as an individual and given the best possible chance. As they grow older, the juveniles get bolder and forest outings are treated like a walk in the park. Out in the forest, you can hear the calls of wild adult males. They're solitary and have large cheek pads on their faces. This male was once an orphan and occasionally returns from the wild for a free lunch. Apes are difficult animals to rehabilitate, but it seems to work for orangutans. If Sepilak continues its good work and there's enough forest left in Borneo to rehome these orphans, perhaps one day their numbers will start to grow in the wild. When it comes to rare animals, the big iconic guys attract all the attention. But a lot of little guys are in trouble too. Here are five of those unsung creatures. The spotted owl lives in old growth forest. Unfortunately, its trees are fast disappearing. The desert pupfish survives in tiny brackish puddles in the summer, but now it's under threat from introduced fish. The salt marsh harvest mouse can drink salt water, but its marshes are being drained to build human homes. The sea cucumber is an animal, not a plant. In Galapagos, it's being harvested in vast numbers, destroying life on the seabed. Spix's macaw is so rare, it's extinct in the wild. The remaining birds are kept under tight security. Whale spotting is always a dream, but catching a glimpse of this pure white whale is something really special. These are belugas, and they live in the Canadian Arctic. They're 15 feet or four and a half meters long and have a mouth that gives them a comical smile. Sailors used to call them sea canaries because of their chirping song. They use these sounds to keep in touch with their group and for navigation. These are treacherous waters. The beluga can dive for 20 minutes, but there's still a risk of getting trapped in the frozen sea. Bouncing clicks off the ice helps them find their way. Sometimes, with miles and miles of frozen sea, the only chance of air is a tiny hole. Get stuck in the ice here, and you'll attract attention. A polar bear can smell a trapped whale at a great distance and is big enough to attack it. But ice and polar bears are hardly a threat to the whole species, so how come there are only a few hundred left? Belugas were almost hunted to extinction by whalers, but now they are celebrated. The best place to see them is in Churchill, Canada. Belugas are also found further to the east and occasionally get very tame, like this calf called Wilma. The chance to dive with a beluga is exhilarating. Wilma came from the St. Lawrence Seaway, and here you'll spot some of the other Arctic whales. Bowheads can be 60 feet or 18 meters long. A single male can weigh more than 10 Indian elephants. 
The huge baleen plates in their mouths filter plankton full of tiny crustaceans called copepods. The most fantastical creature here is the narwhal. This is the whale that may have given rise to the unicorn myth. The spiral horn can be 10 feet or 3 meters long and is in fact a single large tooth. Narwhals feed on squid and arctic cod. Nobody has ever seen them catch one, so we can only wonder how they manage this with such a long spike in the way. In the Arctic summer, inlets open up in the ice and the whales migrate further inland where there are rich feeding grounds. At this time of year, the beluga's skin has become shabby and the warmer seas help it molt. They congregate in gravel bottom bays and use the stones to help rub off last year's skin. When they emerge from last season's coat, the classic white beluga skin shines through once more. As many as several thousand belugas gather in the Churchill River in July. So although they are extremely rare, visit in the summer and you have a great chance to see this enchanting white whale. Next, let's beat a path to the mountains of Africa and meet the biggest ape of all. In the heart of Africa, the mountains rise into spectacular peaks and vast craters. There are active volcanoes here. Their legacy is rich soil and flourishing plant life. The dense undergrowth is home to a gentle giant, the largest of the great apes. This is the mountain gorilla. There are only 650 of them left in the wild. Gorillas live in close family groups, led by a dominant male. The silverback makes decisions about where the family forages and keeps a close eye on all his charges. Since their discovery by Westerners in 1902, mountain gorillas have had a troubled history. Forest guards have struggled to protect them. In 1994, a million Rwandan refugees set up camp in the lava fields below the gorillas' mountains. They needed firewood to cook and to keep them warm at night taking them straight into the heart of the ape's territory. The gorilla's territory is taking a further knock from agriculture. This young adult male can't resist the banana crop illegally planted in the buffer zone around the Virunga National Park. As ape and human worlds collide, gorillas become victims of violence. Females have been shot trying to protect infants being stolen for the pet trade. And poacher's snares cause terrible injuries. Get to know the gorillas and you'll discover that violence is rare in their society. The frightening displays of male silverbacks seldom lead to an attack. Juveniles like to practice acting tough, but the adults intervene if play gets too rough. <laughs> 
They're peaceful vegetarians and spend much of their time eating and digesting their food. Their bellies are swollen with huge amounts of roughage and their plant diet means they regularly let off gas. If you want to go and watch the mountain gorilla in its element, you can arrange trips to Bwindi National Park in Uganda or to Rwanda, where new lodges have been opened to restart the tourist trade. Something that will strike you most about these apes is their sense of wonder. They are transfixed by their own reflection in a camera lens. Creatures like this chameleon become family viewing. They seem just as fascinated by wildlife as we are. Get a permit to come and meet them. It's your interest and your custom as a wildlife tourist that will help save the gorillas. So far, we've seen nine of our 10 wildlife greats, each one more impressive than the last. But what animal could possibly beat the gorilla? Find out our top choice after this recap. Adding the show was Monterey, California for its endearing sea otters. Come here and you could have a whale of a time. Next, we were Australia bound to meet the kangaroo's rare cousins. On Komodo, we entered the land that time forgot. Beware those drooling dragons. In Botswana's Akavango, we saw one of the last refuges for Africa's 4,000 wild dogs. Next, we hopped onto the Galapagos Islands to find equatorial penguins and giant tortoises. Following a call to Madagascar, we soaked up the sun with the lemurs. Then we headed to Malaysian Borneo for its jungle swingers. In the Canadian Arctic, we let belugas and bowheads blow our minds. And fewer than 650 mountain gorillas and remote rainforest made Central Africa our penultimate choice. But our final destination is more exclusive still and has an even rarer mammal. Siberia is our top location for endangered wildlife greats. Don't expect this to be an easy ride. With winter temperatures below minus 20 degrees Celsius, that's minus four Fahrenheit, you'll need to wrap up extremely warm and you must also expect to wait. Our star creature is elusive and shy, the Siberian tiger. This is the biggest cat in the world, and it's so rare, very few people have ever seen a wild one. You'll need to head for Vladivostok in the far east of Russia, next to the Sea of Japan. From here, you must travel 11 hours north to the Sikata Alin Reserve. You'll search long and hard for the Siberian tiger. In the 1940s, only 30 of these beautiful animals were left in the wild. Now their numbers have slowly grown to 200. Traveling on foot has its advantages, and not just for fun. It gives you more a chance to see the small clues that could lead to a big cat. Spot some scratch marks, and you know a tiger must have passed this way. Paw marks are an even better sign. 
Researchers can tell how recently they were made and often which individual tiger made them. Find a freshly stripped boar skull and you can almost feel that tiger breathing down your neck. Tigers can't resist a good meal and they will often feed at night. If you can brave the icy temperatures and set up watch, you could find yourself staring right into the eyes of the most awesome big cat of all. If none of those tricks work, you'll really need to up the stakes. Because these cats are so rare, some of them are radio collared. They can be tracked from the air. If you persevere and eventually spot a Siberian tiger in the wild, you'll join an elite club of wildlife tourists. Nobody will ever be able to outdo your traveler's tales of endangered species. Beauty, strength, and extreme exclusivity. This has to be the ultimate animal high. And that's why we rate Siberia as top choice in our rare wildlife greats. Our destinations have taken you to some of the most beautiful places on Earth. Visit one of them and you're in for a great wilderness experience. And you could be helping to save the rare animals you meet on the way.